And a Fox News alert, British Prime Minister David Cameron raising the country's terror threat level to severe, not citing a specific threat yet. Here he was just moments ago. Now, we cannot appease this ideology. We have to confront it at home and abroad. To do this, we need a tough, intelligent, patient, and comprehensive approach to, de to defeat the terrorist threat at its source. Tough in that we need a firm security response, whether that is action to go after the terrorists, international cooperation on intelligence, and counterterrorism or uncompromising measures against terrorists here at home. He went on to say that they needed to confront what he called a poisonous ideology. Bill Cowan is a retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Marine Corps, Fox News military analyst, comparing President Obama yesterday saying that he didn't have a strategy yet to deal with ISIS with the British prime minister today. Who got it right? Oh, Leland, you know, we all want our president to succeed. We all want America to be safe. But how disappointing to hear Prime Minister Cameron give the speech that our own president should have given before this time. Cameron stands up there resolute. He's telling the British people uh, what they're facing, what they're going to have to do, and our president is still trying to figure out what we're going to do. In fact, I don't think our president has ever acknowledged full force the threat we face from ISIS. And incidentally, most of us call it ISIS, not ISIL, which was a term which went out of uh, form six months ago. And you know, one of the things that's interesting when you listen to David Cameron talking, he talked about the threat not only in t terms of Syria and Iraq, but also the threat ISIS posed to the British homeland as well. He said that there were gaps in the armory, he called them, in terms of dealing with 500 British passport holders who were fighting for ISIS. Does the United States have those same gaps in the armory when it comes to being able to stop people traveling, stop people as they come home, track those who support ISIS and those kinds of things? We certainly haven't heard anybody talk about it, Leland. And, of course, he also said, the prime minister said, that we're going to pull people's passports. We're going to be watching specifically for them. We're not going to accept radical ideology <clears throat> inside of our country. And these are all things that he's being firm about, but we don't know what we're being firm about. We know, for, indeed, that there are Americans serving over there with ISIL. Two of them have died. One was a suicide bomber. So they're over there, but we haven't heard anything from the president about what steps law enforcement or intelligence is taking to identify, locate, isolate, and arrest them. You spent a lot of time in the military and, and intelligence world. What is it, what other tools does American law enforcement, American intelligence need to be able to go after these people and to try and stop this group before it is able to launch some kind of 9-11 style attack? Well, I, I thought, again, the prime, speaking of, the prime Minister did a good job because he really talked about the cooperation we have to have. Certainly after 9-11, we had regional cooperation, uh, unprecedented. Our CIA, instead of just taking secrets, was also giving secrets to allies and friends who were targeted against al-Qaeda as we were. We have to do the same kinds of things continuously with all allies we have who themselves are running their own intelligence operations, who have different sources than we do, but we have to remember not to compromise those sources as we have done in the past. This administration in the past compromised joint intelligence operations by giving up sources of friends and allies. We have to be very careful about what we talk about, but we certainly have to work with friends and allies who themselves are collecting. We have to watch every American passport holder who's going into that area. We have to track them when they're over there. We have to share that information with the Brits, the UK, indeed in many cases maybe with the Iraqis themselves. It's going to be a more comprehensive effort than we currently have, but it's going to be a difficult one and the onus is on law enforcement and intelligence both. And as you look forward in terms of this, is ISIS a very different threat than dealing with al-Qaeda? The prime minister talked about that as well, and in other words, a lot of people have talked about how ISIS is a, a next generational threat. Is this pre presenting a lot of challenges for U.S. policymakers? I, I think it is. I think we still have a lot to learn about this. Uh, you know, al-Qaeda's dream state would have been able to recruit a bunch of Westerners who looked like Westerners who had foreign passports, who could have been operating with them. Instead, all of the people that came here to the U.S. Uh, basically had foreign passports with visas. Some of them, some of them have expired visas, but this really changes the, the, the dynamic. Al-Qaeda wishes they'd have had uh, Westerners like this, and so we're going to have to look at things certainly much different. Of course, Al the size of ISIS versus the size of Al-Qaeda, Leland, as you know, the money that ISIS has versus the money that Al-Qaeda had. We're really dealing with not the JV team, but absolutely the majors, probably the premier team in the major league right now. 
and we're going to have to do a lot of thought about how we're going to deal with them. It's not just a military response. It's a much more comprehensive response. But again, how disappointing that this White House, as of yesterday, uh, even admitting that we, have, we don't have a strategy yet, we really haven't thought our way through it. And speaking of things, as they go forward in terms of the way the United States looks at this, and as you're looking at this from a military planning strategy standpoint, are airstrikes enough against ISIS, or does the United States need to send in special operations teams to try to disrupt this state now that has become a state of terrorism rather than simply a terrorist group residing in a friendly state? Yeah, Leland, you know, we, we can send in special ops teams, but they're not going to be able to get into downtown Mosul and go after some of the leadership or in downtown uh, Syrian cities to go after the leadership. It's really going to require locals that we have worked with on some level. It's going to require the Iraqi Security Services, which is not capable right now of doing it, but or the Kurds. But, you know, both the Iraqis and the Kurds can only operate up to the Syrian border, which means over on the Syrian side, who are we going to be working with? It's not going to be U.S forces going in. We really need to have those regional partners and their regional militaries prepared to put some of their boots on the ground to go after these guys. And those regional partners are probably going to be afraid because they don't want to rile the Sunnis within their own country. So it gets very, very complex very quickly. But the longer we dither, the longer we wait and try to develop a strategy or think about what we do or want to do or fail to work with our European or or uh, regional allies over there, the more ISIS is building itself, the more money it's making as it sells oil and, and takes money off the maybe 8 million people that they control. I thought the number was much smaller. I heard saw today, maybe as many as 8 million people. They're taxing those people. They have an economy going. They're building, they're, they're yeah, reinforcing they're, they're, they're the getting, they're getting, The, the, the amount of money that, they that they're getting as they consolidate power also is unbelievable. And then the regional partners, you have Turkey, a NATO ally, right there on the north. Lieutenant Colonel Cowan, thanks for joining us for your insights and analysis there on ISIS. Martha?